Now, Labour appears to be enjoying a happier period of late as the party enjoys a huge lead in the polls over the government for, well, for a long, long time. Uh, just today, we've seen another U-turn from the Chancellor, who has bowed pressure to bring forward his medium-term fiscal plan. That's a sort of budget to me and you. And publish it alongside independent economic forecasts on October the 31st. So, what can Labour do to keep up the momentum? What can the Conservatives do to claw back that lead? Uh, leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, answering questions to the media on benefits, uh, cross-party uh, issues, and why the Labour Party are in a position to govern now, in his view. On benefits, the government insists they can't decide how to uprate benefits until they've got the latest official data on earnings, on inflation, and an announcement will be made at the end of November. Is that not sensible? Well, uh, there's nothing sensible in a kamikaze budget of two and a half weeks ago, which has caused a loss of confidence in the markets in our economy. Uh, that is having a direct consequence on people. And we're only having this debate about benefits because of the damage that this government's inflicted on our economy. So I don't think it's for the government to tell anybody else uh, what's sensible because they've been totally irresponsible. They know, we know, that benefits should be increased in line with inflation. 40% of those on benefits are in work. 30% can't work because of disability. And I can't think that any political party can possibly think it's right to uh, ensure, you know, to put the most vulnerable in a position uh, where they find it even harder to make ends meet. Why are you talking to unhappy Conservative MPs who want to work with you, potentially, to block any attempt not to increase benefits in line with inflation? Look, where MPs of any political party, including the Tory party, want to work with us to do the right thing, um, then of course we'll work with them. Um, I think it's very telling that um, you know, in the aftermath of this kamikaze budget, uh, we've got a government that's still not taking responsibility for what it has done to our economy in the last two and a half weeks. And instead of actually taking responsibility and reversing it, they're fighting like cats in a sack. And I think for the public looking on, who are directly affected by the irresponsibility of this government, they'll be aghast. So anybody who wants to work with us to help stabilise the economy um, is very, very welcome. And those conversations happening now with some Conservatives? There are always conversations going on across Parliament. How worried are you that your recent Labour's recent poll leads are more to do with problems and turmoil in the Conservative Party rather than you really breaking through with the public? What matters at a time like this, when the government see, when the public see a government in complete chaos, um, having a direct impact on their own finances, is the public, I think, then look at what's the alternative. And I think what this reflects is not only the chaos of the government, but also when they look to Labour, they see a changed party, and they see a party ready to govern and putting forward the solutions for the future. So when it comes to freezing energy bills, we were the first party to say that that should happen. Windfall tax on oil and gas companies out there leading the argument. So it's very important, I think, to reflect not only the chaos of the government in this, but the Labour Party has changed. We're in a position to govern and we are answering the questions that are on the minds of so many millions of people across the country. Hamilton, who's a former advisor to several senior uh, figures in the at Labour Party, Tom Watson, Ed Miliband, and is firmly in the new Labour tradition, I would say. Tom, uh, good to see you. This isn't how I intended to start um, my, my interview with you, but just looking at that clip, don't you think the Labour Party needs a broadcast officer? Because he looks like he's trapped in a storeroom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they make their decisions about where they uh, where they where they put him. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot going on in that shot, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to criticise anyone's background, given that I'm sat in my kitchen finding just about the only spot that hasn't got um, a, a mess behind me. <laughs> Very good. The the point that um, and that was an, a pool clip, what was known as a pool clip, where um, an interview is given to several broadcasters. Uh, to use and, and the point that was made by the journalist doing it for us all was that Labour's fortunes are really down to the Tories' woes, to the government's woes. How fair is that? Well, I think that's probably pretty much always fair of any opposition that uh, that has a lead. Um, you know, there's always this is pretty basic stuff, but you need there's two things that an opposition party needs to win. One is uh, they need a lot of people to think that the government isn't fit to govern anymore, and the second thing is they think need to think that the opposition is is, is ready to come in. And I think um, you know. 
Keir Starmer has done a lot of work with the Labour Party to get into a situation where people think of it as you know, a viable party that they can imagine being a government. They can imagine Keir Starmer being a prime minister um, and not, you know, not being a, a, an embarrassment. Um, they clearly need to do a bit more to explain what they do. I think the, the building blocks are there, but a lot more detail is going to be needed. But to be fair to Labour, there's a couple of years to go. But absolutely, I don't think anyone would deny, I'm sure people at the top of the Labour Party wouldn't deny that the recent performance of the Tory party, um, you know, what Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting have done in the last two or three weeks has, has got has, has a lot to do with what's happened. You haven't seen Labour go from a 10-point lead to a 30-point lead in the polls in, you know, in, in the space of a week just because of things the Labour Party's done. It's uh, a lot of that has to do with the Tories. And a lot of the focus at the moment is on Tories, borrowing plans, unfunded uh, borrowing. But I, I'm not sure that the Labour Party could get through an election campaign. It might be able to get through a five-minute interview here and there, but an election campaign day after day after day, shadow ministers wanting to be ministers, questions on their, questions on their economic plans. I don't think they're there yet. Um, in 1997, they had to go so far to neutralise any worries about them on the economy, they had to say, we're going to stick to Tory spending limits. Is that something that might be necessary again, in your view? Well, the problem with that is in, in 1987, to be fair to everyone involved, the Tories had quite strict spending limits. We knew what they were. One of the big problems we've got with the Tories at the moment is that they've, uh, they just haven't set out what their spending plans are. They haven't set out what their fiscal rule is. We don't know what the uh, what, what, what Tory spending plans are. So it's literally impossible for, the, for Labour to, to commit to sticking to it. That clearly causes it. A different set of problems because it means that it doesn't quite know what the baseline is that it's going to be promising from. But I think what Rachel Reeves has set out in terms of um, making clear that they're not going to do any current spending that hasn't been specifically paid for um, is is the right approach. They're going to have to spend, spell out in a lot more detail what tax rises, tax cuts, spending rises, spending cuts they're going to set out. They've set out a sort of direction of travel but they haven't set out um, the, the specifics of it, and they and they won't. I wouldn't have thought for a while. But I mean, the, they are. I think it's it's unusually they're actually further along that path than the Tories are right now. Though we'll see, okay. have to see what happens at the end of the month. Tom Hamilton, always good to have you on the channel and on, on the show. We'll speak to you again soon, no doubt. But Tom Hamilton, former Labour advisor, thanks very much. Let's get more reaction now with uh, Catherine, our political reporter, joining us in the studio because we're told Liz Truss is now on a charm offensive to try and claw back these leads. What does that actually mean? What does she do? Well, I think she's going to be talking and listening, lots of listening. So Parliament, uh, House of Commons, back from tomorrow. Right. She's going to be holding policy meetings for groups of up to 30 Conservative MPs at a time over the coming weeks. She's going to be going to the tea room much more going to be talking to the 1922 backbench committee, backbench MPs, okay. on Wednesday. Kwasi Kwarteng also is going to be, has said he's going to meet with all Conservative MPs before his medium-term fiscal plan is published at the end of October. So clearly, they are, they've been made aware yeah. by events of the last week that they cannot just go gung-ho, right. doing whatever they like without consequences. If they cannot bring the party with them or sufficient numbers yeah. with them, they simply won't get these policies so, through. So sticky buns to get themselves out of a sticky situation in the tea rooms. But this is the, the problem in that basically the majority of MPs did not vote for her while the majority of the party members did. And is this the, the sort of um, the, the fault line that's running through all this? I think it is, that the majority, I think only a third of them voted for her in the last uh, leadership election mm. before it went to the members. I think only 50 of them voted for her originally. So most of them do not want her in the job in the first place. But also there's an acceptance among many that she is the prime minister that they've got and they've just, just got, got to get on with it. rid mm. of one. So it will be interesting to see. Obviously, there was a total breakdown in discipline last week. Now, Penny Mordaunt, uh, leader of the House of Commons, Soella Braverman, Home Secretary, writing in the Sunday papers saying we need to unify, we need to come back together, having very publicly disagreed with yeah, yeah. policies that Liz Truss was trying to bring forward. And those Sunday papers were also saying that there may have been 20 letters that have gone into Sir Graham Brady already. I mean, is that realistic? 
no one, the only person who knows how Graham many Brady. letters is Graham Brady has <laughs> is Graham Brady. But some very worrying things. I mean, for instance, lovely detail in yesterday's Sunday Times, Grant Shapps has got a new £1,400 phone. Um, what? A foldable phone so he can read a spreadsheet on it. He's got a spreadsheet detailing dozens of conversations where all MPs are at. So, so this is the, the plotter's phone. One thousand four hundred yes. quid's worth. So that should uh, that should worry them, and also some quite unpleasant sort of counter breathing against Michael Gove. Somebody said to be close to the Prime Minister said there's something deeply troubling about the darkness inside Gove. It grips him and takes him over. Now. Uh, the wow. Prime Minister's spokesman was asked in the lobby briefing if Michael Gove was a sadist, and uh, apparently the answer was no. Right, as we'll head to Halloween, of course, for <laughs> this state from Quasi Quarte. Uh, I, I mean, very quickly, has there been quite a, a sort of surprise reaction at this news that they've now brought it forward to October the 31st? I don't really think it's surprising because I think from the moment it was announced yeah. that it was going to be 20, the 23rd of November, lots of people, Mel Strides specifically, but lots of others... Mm were saying this is too long to wait. And only a week ago we were hearing it would be brought forward and then, of course, Kwasi Kwarteng said to Liam Halligan on this channel... We no, remember it well. absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. So lots of things changing. One more thing is they've announced the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury is now um, James Bowler, who's Treasury official of 20 years standing. Kwasi Kwarteng had wanted to bring in Antonio Romeo. Apparently that appointment had been made but not announced and Liz Truss has insisted on... Um, Oh, tension between number yeah. 10 and number 11. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much indeed. As ever, Thank Catherine. You.